Hey guys, this is Tammy with Nurse Minder and today we're talking all about vital signs and in particular temperature. I often get asked, what is a fever? Or I'll have students come to me and say, my patient is 37.5, what should I do? So we're going to talk a little bit about temperature and fever right after this. Welcome back, my name is Tammy and this is Nurse Minder and on this channel we do everything nursing. So if you're new here, consider subscribing below so that you get the next video when it's released. Welcome to the Vital Signs Temperature video asking the question, what is a fever? Now in a previous episode I did go over how to use a Tempodot to take a temperature and I'm going to link that video up here. But we're going to really focus on what is a temperature in this video. Now, in order to understand what a fever is, we need to understand the things that are happening in our, inside our body that helps us determine what our normal temperature is. So we have this baseline, as you can see here, 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6 Fahrenheit. And this is considered our set point, kind of like where cells will function in their best. But we have a range. and Typically earliest in the morning is when our temperature is the lowest and we might be down around 36 degrees Celsius or 97 Fahrenheit. And it is highest in the middle of the afternoon and we can go all the way up to 37.5, 99.5 Fahrenheit. Now it's important to note that these numbers that I'm presenting here, those may be different than what your textbooks and your resources are providing for you. But just note the concept here is that we have a range of normal temperatures that we can move in and out of throughout the day, and that is a normal phenomenon. This is all controlled by the thermoregulatory center, and this is located in the hypothalamus. And what body temperature truly is, is really just the difference between the heat that our body is producing, whether that is through cellular activity or through exercise, or maybe you're wrapped up between a whole bunch of different blankets and heating, heating tools, so it's the temperature between heat production and the heat that we lose through respiration, through all sorts of other activities. Maybe you are holding onto a cold drink in your hand. And, and it, in the end, essentially what we have is this kind of range that I talked about here, about where we normally like to sit and where we are comfortable. Consider the thermal regulatory center in your brain to be very much like a thermostat. You set the, th the temperature in your house and as soon as the temperature gets too low, there is a set point in which the, the furnace will kick on and come back up. And so in this case, we're gonna say that's 36 degrees. Once the temperature in the house reaches 36 degrees, the furnace kicks on to increase our temperature. And in our body, what that looks like is we start to feel cold and we start to put on blankets and we start to shiver and maybe your teeth are chattering and inside your blood vessels are constricting and getting smaller to bring all the heat back towards the core of the body. Now, just like that temperature on your thermostat, when it gets too hot in the house, it needs to stop running the furnace. And it's the same thing in our body, in the hypothalamus, when we reach a certain set point, 37.5 is what I have in my example. Again, check your agency's policy. But when we reach that point, the activities that are increasing body temperature are slowed down. And so you'll start to find that our body will create an atmosphere in which we can get rid of heat. That's when we start to sweat. Our face gets flushed. We have increased breathing because we want to blow off the heat and our vessels will vasodilate, which means they get really wide and they bring all of that blood to the surface of the skin so we can get rid of the heat through the temperature in the room. Now in a fever, what happens is someone's come along and they have reset the thermostat. And this is the same in the body. This can be because of injury, disease, infection, but something is in there playing with the thermostat and it says, nope, we want it to be 39 degrees. And that's because some of these diseases function better in a hotter environment. And sometimes this is because there is an interruption in how the hypothalamus is receiving messages. Now a low grade fever, this is where we get a lot of confusion in the workplace as to when should we be concerned. So a low grade fever is a slight elevation. And here I've got between 37.6 and 38.5. Some people may be a little bit more concerned as it gets to 38 and that's fine. In the hospital, we typically don't get too 
excited about running tests until we reach 38.5, but there are exceptions. So a low grade fever is just a slight elevation. It might be accompanied with feelings of um, just feeling tired and fatigued. However, if it comes along with a rash or swelling or maybe a stiff neck or chest pain, you would definitely want to seek medical attention before the fever gets higher than that. Now a high grade fever is greater than 38.6 Celsius or 101 Fahrenheit. And this is typically where you're gonna to start to see us in the hospital order blood work. We might order blood culture system, urinalysis. We're gonna do chest x-rays to see if maybe it's the lungs. You're gonna see a whole host of client specific, patient specific interventions to identify the cause of that fever. Now it's important to note here that in our children and our geriatric population, the temperatures are different. In infants in particular, once it gets greater than 38 degrees, if I come back a slide, 38 degrees and rectal is the preferred method in children, then we would start to con concerned. Geriatric population, this is a little bit more about knowing their baseline. And I see that my word baseline is separated there, no big deal. I know someone's gonna pick it up and point it out, so I thought I would share it with you. We might find that a geriatric can go as low as 35.7, 35.6, even 35.4 I've seen in, in some patients, up to low 37, 37.3. And this might be their normal, which means a temperature of 37.4 might in fact be a low grade fever for your geriatric population. In this case, we'd like to try and get a baseline, like look at their trends to know where they normally sit. And the key thing here is to watch for changes of 1.1 degrees Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit above their baseline. And that will help you further indicate or identify if they are having a fever. Now, did you know that fevers have patterns? This is for the geeks out there. I always like to dig a little bit further. So for those who are geeky like me, stay tuned. We're gonna talk about the fever's patterns and then we're gonna talk about some of the general treatment things you might recognize and see in hospital or in the community. Number one, intermittent fevers. This is where your temperature will return to normal at least once in a 24 hour period. Now this is pretty common for those who have got gram negative and gram positive infections. That's something we do with our blood work to identify abscess and sepsis patients. Now that doesn't mean this is the only kind of fever these patients can have, but it's just commonly found that they will have an intermittent, they'll go febrile, then they'll come back down within at least once in 24 hours. That's the intermittent. A remittent fever is actually one where it doesn't return to baseline. If this black line is considered my 37 degrees, my normal baseline, you'll see here that my temperature is always elevated. Maybe this is a 38.3 to a 38.5, back down to a 38.3 up to a 38.7, 38.2 up to a 39. It just continually stays elevated and bounces back and forth about a degree in either direction, a few degrees in either direction of this new set point. Remember this black line is 37, this might be 38.3 now and it's bouncing back and forth. This is common with infectious diseases that are caused by bacteria, virus, fungi, parasites. So they're not diagnostic patterns in the sense, but they're more about identifying what is happening in your patient and using the right terminology. The third one is called a sustained fever. This is where the temperature does not return to baseline. Commonly seen in drug-induced fevers where it leads to a hypermetabolic state and your cells are really all in a hyperdrive, they're all producing more heat and it's increasing the core body temperature. And last one is we have a relapsing fever. This is where one or more recurrent episodes of a fever occur. Now each fever can be hours to days but what's important is that there is one or more days in between the next onset of a fever. So here we've got one, two, three, four days, and all of a sudden spike again. Come back down for one, two, three, four days, and all of a sudden spike again. This is a relapsing fever. Now another one of interest. So typically for these types of fevers, we're gonna see a variety of interventions such as maybe Tylenol, ibuprofen, aspirin, and those are all designed to reset that thermostatic set point and bring it back down to normal. That's the goal of our therapy. Now here's an interesting one, it's called neurogenic fever. 
This is when there is damage or trauma to the central nervous system, and that includes the brain and the spinal cord. Typically, this may be seen with people who have got maybe a spinal cord injury, or they have had a bleed, some maybe a stroke, and there is bleeding in the brain, so there is an intracerebral bleeding, or there's increased intracranial pressure as a result of that bleed or other pathology. What's important to note here is that these are resistant to antipyretic therapy, and they are not associated with sweating. Caring for a fever may require a variety of interventions. One of the first things we start to feel, there are actually stages to a fever, where we kind of get that prodromal, we just don't feel really well, and then we start to get the hairs on our arms rise, and we start to get the shivers, want to feel like we bundle up in the covers because we're just cold, and then the fever hits, right? So the treatment will vary in terms of the patient and what they would accept and in terms of our goals. So the goal is obviously to get the temperature down. And so there are ways we can do that. We can put a cold pack on our forehead, a face cloth. If it's really hot, you can put those cold packs under the armpit and in those heat generating areas. Take the blankets off, leave one blanket just to help with that comfort measure. And then we can also give cold fluids. We definitely wanna be drinking a lot because Fevers increase those non-sensible losses, so the sweating, and we can get dehydrated really easily. So there's fluids, maybe a cold, cool sponge bath or a shower, but here's the key. When it comes to these measures to help dissipate the heat, when we get to the point where the patient starts to shiver, we need to shut it down because shivering actually increases heat and we don't want that to happen. So. If you're giving a nice sponge bath, you start to see the goosebumpies on your arm, stop the sponge bath, get out of it because you need to put some clothes on because you're now starting to create heat and we don't want to do that. Of course, there is your Tylenols, your acetaminophens, um, sorry, same thing, huh. ibuprofen is what I meant to say, um, aspirin, those are all used in fever control. Of course, aspirin, do not use it in children. We know that there's a risk for rise, but there are medications that we can take to reduce and bring down the set point back in that hypothalamus so that our temperature comes down. Now we do need to find the cause and we don't always know the cause. There are fevers of unknown origin, but if we do have a cause, we can then give antibiotics if that's the case. If it's a fungal, we can give antifungals depending on what the issue is. And maybe we need to do some isolation if it's a tuberculosis. Now some fevers are more common with diseases like Hodgkin's or cancer, and those treatments would be very different. We need to actually address the cause. So hydration, rest, and nutrition is important because what happens in a fever is our body goes into using up our fat stores as opposed to using carbohydrates, so we need to keep refueled, and antipyretics should you need them. Of course, always consult your physician uh, if you have any concerns and stay safe. Thanks for watching. Now you know a little bit more about a fever and when you should or shouldn't worry. And of course, always checking your agency's policies and seeking medical attention should you think you have a fever that needs some interventions. Until next time, guys, make it a great day.